Hi guys, and welcome back to this week's episode of Let's Chat Ethics. I'm your co-host, Oriana. And I'm your other co-host, Amanda. So this week I started reading this book called Design Justice by Sasha Constanza Chalk. And I thought it had a very interesting story in, in the introduction. Um, so the author is trans and they're talking about their experience going through airport security. So those machines that they use to check uh, if you have objects on you, the ones where you have to put your hands up above your head and like the shape of a triangle and it kind of like swishes around you. Um, So those are designed in a way that it has a quote-unquote idea of the the human body in terms of uh, male or female. And so because the author is trans, she's talking about their experience um, and to be clear the author uses they them or she her pronouns according to her bio on her website um, so sorry if I ex- interchange them um, yeah so they're talking about their experience every time they have to go through security because since these machines are based on their idea of uh, male or female physique if uh, the, the author tends to get detected as having some kind of object on them. Um, and in addition, when you have, uh, if, if the machine detects that you have an object on you, you then get patted down by either a male or a female security guard. And Yeah, I never yeah, even yeah, I think thought of is... that. <laughs> yeah, there's something obviously that I've obviously navigated in my life in a privileged way where I've never even had to actually uh-huh. think about. Oh yeah, of course, like a woman's patting me down because... I identify as a woman and I'm coming up on that. Yeah. Yeah. And you also, you know, you present very much as... Like femme. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, the author does say that they tend to ask her if she prefers a male or a female guard to pat her down. But, you know, for example, neither is not an option where she would prefer uh, a non-binary person. So... Yeah, I thought this was a, a very interesting story that is um, also very relevant to today's topic. And if you remember from last week, guys, we are going through the European guidelines on trustworthy AI. And today we're talking about um, technical robustness. So technical robustness is very key because you might have a system that has been developed with the best intentions and that is lawful and ethical. But if it's not technically robust, then it can have negative consequences. And there are levels to these consequences, which we're going to get into uh, during this episode. Um, And they can range from sort of microaggressions or straight up discrimination, like in the story that uh, we were just talking about. So, Ariana, do you have any initial thoughts? Okay, so my initial thoughts after listening to um, that like story from the book is that that just proves that we need people um who have who have these experiences in the design process otherwise we're going to completely continue to miss the mark i.e like this story with the security systems at airports obviously for someone like myself I've navigated life with a certain privilege and never had to think of that when I'm going through airport security and I'm assuming the people who designed this are also the same. They've never had to think um, that this would even be something that would cause upset and actual harm, harm to someone's like well-being. So I think that just proves that in terms of ethics and when we're talking about ethics, we need these people in the room there to talk about those experiences and make sure, you know, this is what's going to happen. So when you're talking about like technical robustness and kind of, getting to a point where we have something in the development stage and then when we're testing it out we we need to make sure everyone's experiences are included and thinking of every every possible thing that outcome that can happen I don't know it's not possible to think of every outcome always but this is an outcome which in our society that we live in now shouldn't be missed anymore and shouldn't miss the mark on that yeah, and that I think is a, a very compelling point. And actually, the the report emphasizes uh, two kinds of robustness, right? So the example that we were just talking about is an example of social robustness. So where we need to make sure that 
it doesn't make any social faux pas, but we also have the the technical robustness. So because things can also go wrong, obviously at uh, at the technical level, um, and yeah, I think uh, a nice one of my favorite examples of things going wrong uh, at a technical level is um, table at the Microsoft table yeah. in table. <laughs> Uh, I I don't know how many of the listeners have heard about this chatbot, but basically it um it, it had a really nice idea behind it, which is that it could learn from the interactions it had with with users, and this is really cool because um it's actually really really hard to build a chatbot that is open domain. So maybe a lot of you have interacted with customer service chatbots or. Uh, maybe flight booking systems or something like that. But um, if you've ever tried uh, an open domain chatbot where you just make kind of chit chat about your weekend and stuff, they tend to be really terrible. Um, and that's really hard because if you think about the like every conversation you've ever had in your life, you've you've never hopefully never had exactly the same conversation twice unless you record a podcast maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But that makes it extremely hard for machine learning. So the idea that you can train the system kind of live through the interactions it has with people is pretty cool. But if you've ever been on Twitter, um, then you probably know that there is a lot of questionable stuff going on on the internet. So I think this chatbot made it for like 16 hours before it had to be taken offline because it had turned into a horrible Nazi and not even anti-feminist like straight up misogynistic um chatbot and i think this is a really nice example of where you know you really needed to have some kind of safeguard to make sure that this wasn't happening so this is a you know known as a data poisoning where people can use bad data to train your model and i think for <laughs> thinking about that example i wonder if there was anyone in the room that thought that maybe twitter wouldn't be a place to train <laughs> to train yeah. a chatbot because when even when I go on Twitter and I tend to mainly follow like coherent people, <laughs> um, you still get on your feed like stuff that you're like, what, what on earth is that? And it's coming, and there's so much misinformation, and obviously there's fake accounts and people who like trolling, and just people who say wild things on Twitter. So. I would have, you would have thought that there would have been someone in the room, but like, hmm, getting data from Twitter might <laughs> send our bot into a <laughs> crazy, extreme, right wing fascist. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you. I mean, you would think that, but then that example just shows how going into these guidelines that should have been thought through, and like you said, these safeguards should have been put in place and actually there shouldn't be people strategizing there to think what will the outcome be and I guess this is an example mm -hmm. of um an AI and like you know, natural language processing where people have just straight away thought just about the positives and how excited they are maybe like living in the yeah. moment rather than thinking of the long-term consequence yeah exactly um and I think this is uh, a problem that tends to move through um, a lot of AI and data science practices, which is always looking at the the positives and maybe not considering the, the negative aspects enough. So I think a, a similar a similar example in, the, in terms of the where it went wrong that it might, you know, maybe if there had been more thought put into the potential negative consequences um, is the uh, now infamous prison sentence prediction system where uh, given the the criminal records of, of people or case information, it would predict how likely they were to um, what I'm looking for. Um, how likely they would be to, com to commit, yeah, to commit crime another crime in the future. Um, so the sentence prediction algorithm um, sorry, so this prison sentence algorithm is now well known to have been heavily biased against black and Latinos, um, black and Latino people. And I think it's similar to the 
um, the tabled example in that it was a matter of um, the lack of, of technical robustness. Um, but obviously here we can see that there's a massive difference in the, the consequences, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. I think this example just shows that, you know, how easily it can go from something like which the table, which I guess you could actually have a bit of a laugh at, be like, ha ha ha, like it's a, it's a little bot that went a bit wrong and picked up some, you know, terrible language, but it didn't have like serious consequences. So that could be seen as something as small consequence in the long term but then yeah the prison system the the algorithms predicting um whether people are going to go that commit crime and even predicting sentences is just the extreme of how that can completely destroy someone's life and especially in the u.s where a lot of states once you've gone to jail you then can't vote again and we know how in the states that what like people once people have been through the prison system are best especially like black and Latinos there, um, they can't get jobs, they can't like get mortgages, all these like knock on effects that basically suppress them in society. So again, if you, whoever thought of that idea, it's just kind of re reflecting biases that are already within society. And that's why, mm -hmm. again, the technical robustness side and having, making sure that we have actual representation at the level of, development and deployment and design so i think that's an example of how it can go like really really wrong and that actually um makes me think of recently in the uk with the a level predictions the algorithm yeah. predicting people's a levels and then it came out that the algorithm was going by postcode and socioeconomic um pl like place in society basically so the algorithm was completely discriminating against anyone who was from a low income household and was predicting them lower grades, which meant they couldn't get into their university of choice, which is wild to me. But then I think it's, as I was saying, it's already reinforcing a system, which if you look at the United Kingdom, it's always been extremely classist <laughs> as a society. Yeah, I'm... Very classist. Yeah, I'm, I'm really... Honestly, surprised that in the year that we're in, anybody would include something like postcode in uh, in an algorithm to try to predict really anything other than maybe housing prices. I know. <laughs> um, you know, uh, that's quite that. That's really shocking, and I think. Yeah, I think it just goes to show how important it is to have education because there are, you know. There's people in the industry whose job it is to write tests to m make sure that things are working properly and stuff. And I wonder if um, I wonder how many of them are testing for for biases. So not just mm -hmm. does the model or the program work correctly the way that you want it to work, but very specifically, how do you want it to work? And yeah, it definitely seems like checking for bias should be a major. Mm. Because if you major test, yeah. Because if you just want to look at from like a a more of a like a shallow level, you you could be like these companies that aren't thinking these things through. Well, they're just shooting themselves in the foot, and they're gonna lose. They're gonna lose money long term. And like the the bosses of the I've forgotten the name of the company that were doing the A level results, but they all had to resign, so they've lost their jobs. So if you mm -hmm. I don't I mean I personally don't feel sorry for them, but you want to look at it just from that small level of like that's cost them their jobs and it's going to cost them money and bad press so they clearly didn't think any of that through but then on the actual flip side the the more ethical side they've literally well thankfully everyone protested and took the street but they caused like real emotional damage for a while because a lot of people were like i haven't gone to my university which is terrible when you think about it that's their future and it was literally because their family might have lived in a, a low economic area and deemed that they wouldn't be good enough to get into certain universities, which is, which is wild. So it just, yeah, it just proves that you, you have to think all these things through and actually test, <laughs> test these things out. Otherwise it just is going to cause just mass problems. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, actually, it's something that the report kind of tries to emphasize that the reason 
you know, the, the report is like there are guidelines for trustworthy AI. Um, it's not for great ethical AI or anything. It's about trust and getting people to trust the artificial intelligence that we're building. And one of the reasons they cite for that is that they don't want to have problems uh, or like, you know, we don't want to have to deal with problems of people not wanting to adopt new technologies because they don't trust it. Now, I don't know to what extent um, people trust or don't trust. I mean, I think um, this is maybe a topic for another another episode, um, how trust affects actual uptake. So I'm, I'm thinking about social media and how people actually do use it, even though a lot of people would say they don't trust Facebook or whatever. But anyway, so yeah, examples like these is really, yeah, examples like these really highlight how important it is to make sure that everything works from the get-go because I don't know how likely we are to ever trust a uh, um, great prediction system for um you know in the future or things like i mean actually i don't i don't think there should be a prison sentence prediction i think we like to think that this is going to remove human bias but is it yeah no of course not especially especially when um historically um like if we're looking at the states again the black community has been like marginalized and suppressed so the data they're going to be inputting is just going to be reinforcing um, the notion that uh, black men are more likely to commit crimes and et cetera, et cetera. So I think that, in my opinion, should be completely wiped out. Because especially when we think of like juries and judges like that we've had historically in um, in courts, if it ever gets to a stage where we're just completely reliant on tech, then that goes back to our episode about the robot like Alfie can this tech have human nature and can it understand right from wrong and would it be able to, to give the the real um what's the word I'm looking for what's that word nuance the, the real the real no- nuances of being an actual human where you can think think things through and I guess that's what we've been the existential crisis we have in AI is will it ever have human consciousness? <laughs> that's the, I think that's, the, that's been the, yeah. the ongoing debate, robots taking over the world and all that. <laughs> you know, take over the world by putting everybody in prison, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh God. But actually, um, I was thinking about something that I read in in the 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 report overall in the guidelines, like a quote from um the EU guidelines over, and it made me think about how you could apply this quote to social media. So I'm just gonna read out the quote. <laughs> <laughs> this should also apply to potential changes in their operating environment or the presence of other agents, human and artificial that may interact with the system in an adversarial manner. In addition, the physical and mental integrity of humans should be ensured. So I was thinking about applying the the last bit really about the physical and mental integrity of humans in terms of when you're looking at like social media and Facebook and the Facebook algorithms. Can we can we say that the the mental and physical integrity of humans are being ensured? My personal opinion is I'm not so sure, but I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on that. <laughs> so I guess my first thought is, of course, there's been so many reports of people developing body image issues and other psychological problems from social media. I know that, um, you know, if you're scrolling through your feed and you see that everybody is off in like China and having amazing lives and going on holiday in Bali and you see all these like fitness yeah. models that are just sipping on their smoothies <laughs> <laughs> um, you know I think I can definitely sympathize with that that feeling of uh, my life is so boring all I'm doing is sitting at home alone working on my PhD self-isolating and I can't afford acai berries for my smoothies. <laughs> um, 
Now, I'm laughing a bit about it, but it, it is quite serious. I read even that there's people that are trying to get plastic surgery so that they can look more like themselves oh, when like they the have filters. a filter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, yeah, that's that's been a whole thing. Yeah. So in that sense, I think social media is definitely not maintaining um, the mental integrity and potentially the physical integrity of, of people. Um, but at the same time, on some level, I don't know, is this helping my mental integrity? But I like, you know, I've, I've lived in many different countries and I really like being able to keep tabs on all the people I've met all over the world and, and traveling and stuff. And there might not be people that I'm going to have a call with just randomly. You know? And I think it would be quite weird if you're like, hi, I haven't talked to you in two years and I'm just wondering how you're doing. <laughs> in fact, it is weird when somebody does that over social media. Um, but it's less weird somehow if you just leave a comment on somebody's picture. Um, but, you know, seeing what they share and you're kind of like, oh, my God, this person now lives in Germany and they got married and oh my god look, they have such a cool job and that's quite quite a nice way i think to to keep in touch with with people so on the one hand yeah i would agree that the effect that social media is having on people overall can be quite negative but i do think it has some positive aspects mm. yeah I, I mean i can yeah i can definitely see the positive side like i too have like lived in different countries and traveled and it's it makes it really easy to keep in contact with people um yeah that you wouldn't necessarily usually have that time like I have a friend who I met in Thailand and she lives in Australia and then I went to her wedding a few like a few years ago and we'd kept in contact for like five years but if you know social media hadn't been around realistically you would have just lost contact I think yeah so that kind of side I do think is a positive but then I guess it's like weighing out like does do those positives massively override some of the real like negative sides like even with the machine learning like algorithms on Facebook purposely trying to get people addicted and constantly on their phones and constantly going in this like kind of cycle of like advertising and like going kind of down these like dark holes and Really, the only person gaining people gaining from that are the, the tech companies that are, and the advertising companies that are kind of locking you in this kind of cycle. So I just wonder if overall, do the what like where do you find the balance of the negative versus the positive? Because I do think um, Facebook and and Twitter and all these platforms have also a duty to kind of start filtering out. Um, a lot of the fake news as well that we've seen that we spoke about in the other episodes about how that's then gone on to influence elections and had these the more the more darker side of the social media that I guess a lot mm. of us on a day to day don't realize we're ingesting yeah I think that's um a really interesting discussion that we probably should have in another episode because I think the time is running <laughs> running out for this this week's episode but actually um probably after we're done with the guidelines we should talk about do companies have a duty to remove like social media companies do mm. they have a duty to remove fake news maybe hate speech etc yeah from from their platforms and that can definitely be a topic for another day. after the guidelines yeah <laughs> i think i think definitely I think we're. <laughs> I feel like we've we've got a lot of a lot. I feel like there's so many uh, topics we can discuss in in this podcast. And any and if anyone actually has any they want us to discuss, feel free to reach out to us. Yeah, we'd love to hear any ideas, any feedback. Um, yeah. Well, thanks for tuning in, guys. Yeah, next week we'll be discussing the guideline privacy and governance. Oh, and if you oh, want to, that's gonna be a good one. That will. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to catch up with us on social media we're at let's chat ethics on twitter yeah or you can email us at let's chat ethics at gmail.com whoop, whoop. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see you next week see you next week guys bye bye